Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's program. Please stay tuned to the end of today's program for a brief update. We have a terrific lineup of live streams coming to you in September and October, so you'll want to get all the facts. For those of you who are not yet a member, please consider joining. It really helps support our organization and there's some terrific benefits. You can find out about all the benefits of membership on our website at lawacth.org. It's now my great pleasure to bring on Dan Schnur and politics in the time of coronavirus. Dan, we have some big heavy topics to unpack tonight. Wow. <laughs> How are you doing? Not too bad. How about yourself, Kim? It's busy. I, it's crazy busy for everybody, but I think everyone's enjoying your new time slot. So we're really happy about that. But let's get your, your subjects. Today, why the US and China relationship is about to get even worse. And secondly, lessons for the midterms from the recall. Wow. Take it away, Dan. Thank you. All right. Lots to cover, of course, but that tends to be our, our MO every week. And so today, mainly because this is some feedback we've been getting from the surveys after the program each week, because we've been hearing from more and more of you that you prefer that we go into just a couple of topics in greater detail rather than covering a, a larger number of topics more lightly. So we're gonna focus on the US-China relationship given its tremendous import. And then we're also gonna talk not so much about the recall election itself now that it's over, but more about the lessons we can draw from it as we prepare to head into next year's critical midterm elections. So topic number one, why the US-China relationship is getting worse. Now you've all been, you've all been reading about the diplomatic brawl that's developed between the US and France over the last several days. The US, of course, signed a defense agreement with Great Britain on, in Australia, which undermined a previous military deal that Australia had struck with France some years ago. Now, the French government was furious. They accused the US of stabbing them in the back. And in what the White House considered to be a particularly low blow, the French defense minister said that Biden's behavior on this was very similar to that of Donald Trump's. And if you want to get Joe Biden's advisors mad at you, that's a pretty good way to do it. And so upset, so upset were the French that they actually recalled their ambassador to the United States for the first time in, in history. Now, we've talked, we talked a few weeks ago about the nature of how the U.S withdrawal from Afghanistan angered, greatly angered many of our European allies. And now this has made things worse, not just with France, but with the European Union as well. But we're gonna save, we're gonna save the US relationship with Europe for another day, because the reason for the Biden administration's nuclear agreement with Australia to supply them with nuclear powered submarines is entirely about preparing for potential Chinese military aggression in that part of the world. And so before we move on and get deeper into the US-China challenge, Claire, maybe we can put up the first question for the group just on the basis of this incident. And question for all of you, what's your opinion of the defense agreement that President Biden struck with Australia and Great Britain? Number one, do you agree that it was the right thing to do because we need to protect ourselves and the Pacific Rim against potential Chinese aggression. Number two, that it was the right thing to do. We needed to step up our defense, our mutual defense capability in that region, but we should have told France about it in advance. The third, you disagree with Biden and our relationships with our longtime allies are much more important and offending the French and other European countries was a very bad thing to do. Fourth, uh, that you disagree with Biden, not just on the way the agreement was handled, but more broadly, 
And the question that many are asking is, are we needlessly provoking China through this more aggressive behavior? And five, finally, because this is still really an emerging story, I don't know, these things are pretty complicated. So let's see what our group had to say on this, on this first question, Claire. Wow, look at that, very interesting. 78% of you agreed that this was the right thing to do, that the US-Australia military deal was the right thing to do for security and geopolitical purposes. So more than three quarters of you think it was the right thing to do. But 68%, more than two thirds of our overall group said, well, we should have told France in advance. Now what the Biden administration has leaked out is that telling France would have allowed the news to leak out publicly, which could have undermined the deal altogether. But once again, it's a lesson in the difficulties that this president has been having navigating a relationship with Europe that seemed to be pretty well set for dramatic improvement uh, when he replaced Trump as president last January. Numbers on the other three options are much lower. So let's move on and, and we'll uh, put aside the French, uh, uh, US, Australia, China question for a minute in order to focus more specifically on China. Because if you think the French were mad, and of course they were, to a large degree, it's because their feelings were hurt. They were embarrassed by the fact that their longtime ally pulled out the rug from under them on this. Now, granted, this was a very expensive military contract that they've lost, but a lot of this was about appearances and saving face. On the other hand, China was very angry too, and for a much different set of reasons. For France, this is about public impressions. For China, this agreement between the US and Great Britain and Australia, that represents a major military escalation right in their front yard, and they did not respond to it well at all. Now, last week, I told you about how John Kerry, President Biden's emissary on climate change, went to China and how badly he was treated on his trip there. You may remember that senior Chinese officials would only meet with him by video and they cited the coronavirus as the reasons for that. But it's now been reported that a couple of weeks before Kerry's trip to China, senior Chinese officials met in person with a Taliban delegation. So that was after Kerry traveled halfway around the world before they told him they weren't gonna meet with him in person. So they finally sent a fairly junior representative to see him face to face, but only after keeping the American delegation waiting for a very extended period. And so, but now we know, as a little bit of time has passed and more information has come out, that the substance of the discussions between Kerry and the Chinese was even worse. In addition to the humiliation that they, that they put him through, Kerry was essentially told that climate change policy, which Biden had hoped to keep separate from human rights and economic and security issues would become much more difficult and that the Chinese would be much more reluctant to cooperate on climate change issues if the US continued to be so confrontational on these other matters. And already there's a number of human rights advocates in this country and in Asia who say they're seeing a softening of the Biden administration's language on treatment of the Uyghurs on Hong Kong and in other human rights issues. So keeping these issues compartmentalized would allow the US to be more confrontational toward China on economic and human rights grounds. Doesn't look like China's gonna let that happen, which com complicates progress on all of these fronts. Now at the same time, as we've already talked about, Biden is clearly ramping up on the defense front, which as I said a moment ago, is not making the Chinese happy. The submarine deal is a major step forward for Australia's defense capability. And Biden is meeting in person this Friday with the leaders of not only Australia, but Japan and India, the so-called Quad, which was formed several years ago to counter potential Chinese aggression in, in the Indo-Pacific. But for years, the Quad, the US, Australia, Japan, India Alliance, was a meeting of mid-level officials. And now that it's escalated to meetings between presidents and prime ministers, 
This obviously indicates a very heightened level of import and an even sharper U.S. focus on military presence and defense capability in the, uh, uh, in the, Pacific, Rim, in the Pacific Rim area. So let's put up our second question for all of your consideration, if we can, Claire. What do you think should be our top priority with China, knowing that we can't separate out these issues the way we once thought might be possible? What's most important? Is it increasing security in the region, which does mean a, a heightened military presence? Does it mean working together on climate change? Does it mean creating economic growth and job opportunities as our top priority there? both internationally and here domestically, as the U.S. struggles to get out of a post-COVID recession? Fourth, is it protecting human rights, the atrocities in Northwest China, and the threats to Hong Kong and potentially to Taiwan? And five, none of the above. Dan, we have more important priorities than China. Why are we talking about this instead of other hotspots around the world that present a more immediate potential danger to the U.S. and to the world? So once again, let's see what we got, Claire, in terms of, in terms of answers. Well, once again, very, very interesting. 41% uh, of you, a little bit more uh, than, than security, say that climate change should be our most important issue. And now what that implies, is John Kerry was told uh, earlier this month, is in order to work together with the Chinese on climate change, it means backing down on some of these other areas. Just behind climate change, 37% is increasing security in the region. So already we see these top two issues in some ways working across purposes with each other. And then at a much smaller percentages are economic growth and job opportunities, even in a recession. And look at that, only 6% believe that protecting human rights should be our top policy priority when dealing with, with this country and this region. So back to, the, uh, back to the work that the US is doing in the area, uh, the group, the quad I mentioned earlier, uh, Australia, India, Japan, and the US, those four countries have also reached out and are now including New Zealand, South Korea, and Vietnam in many of these discussions. It's being called the quad plus. But even as the US begins to pivot to China, as Barack Obama had indicated he wanted to do more than a decade ago, the Biden administration's treatment of France and the European Union, Union seems to undermine this approach to some degree. Because from the very beginning, since taking office, Biden has also always emphasized the importance of Europe playing a key role in the Pacific Rim. There's even been some talk about NATO expanding its mission to take on this potential challenge. So on one hand, turning our nation's focus to the Pacific Rim, but on the other hand, potentially weakening our relationships with our European allies, well, let's just say that that does send some mixed signals. The other area of engagement that continues to be somewhat puzzling to me is on the issue of trade. Now, it's been clear for some time that the Clinton-Obama era of free trade in the Democratic Party is over just as the Reagan-Bush era of free trade in the Republican Party is largely in, is largely in retreat. But to step, despite many statements during the campaign that Biden made about strengthening economic relationships in Asia, Biden has not moved yet, several months after taking office, to re-enter the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the 12-country trade deal that Barack Obama, Biden's former boss, had negotiated with several uh, Pacific countries, both uh, the West, in the Western and the Eastern Hemisphere. Now that the US is backing away from that trade agreement, here's where it gets interesting. China has approached those other countries, those other 11 countries who negotiated a trade agreement with the US several years ago, and has now seen the United States stepping back. China is now inquiring about potentially joining that deal with, of course, the same countries that Biden is trying to strengthen U.S. relationships with to stand up to China. And while there was some thought when Biden took office that he might repeal some of the tariffs that Trump had instituted in his trade war with China, 
it now appears that the White House is looking to put together broader international support for new additional tariffs in response to China's use of industrial subsidies. So the trade walls of anything are getting bigger. We should also, what we should also be watching is the way the Chinese are leveraging the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan to create greater nervousness in Taiwan about whether the United States will maintain its commitment to that country in the face of China's increasingly assertive presence uh, in the waters surrounding Taiwan. And Biden is looking for ways to reassure Taiwan and Japan and South Korea for that matter that they should not overinterpret our withdrawal from Afghanistan to believe that the U.S. will be any less committed to their mutual defense should the need arise. And so it got very little attention in the, in the United States. But a few weeks ago, as a way of reassuring Taiwan and Japan and South Korea, a few weeks ago, the American military conducted the largest joint exercises in the Western Pacific since the end of the Cold War with US, British, Australian, and Japanese military forces all coordinating as a way not so much of sending a conf confrontation-based message to China, but a reassuring message to US allies in the region that the United States is not gonna walk away from them. Now on a much more symbolic front, uh, Biden is also planning, I've read, to rename Taiwan's diplomatic office in Washington. We don't call it an embassy because that would be very offensive uh, to the mainland Chinese government but they're exploring a name that they can give to the diplomatic office for Taiwan that would recognize a more official role between Taiwan and the United States. And of course, that's gotten China even angrier. So what does this all add up to? Basically, what we have is a multi-dimensional chess game that Biden has correctly identified as our country's greatest international challenge of the 21st century. So there's a lot going on with China and on the Pacific Rim, economically, diplomatically, militarily, in terms of human rights, in terms of climate change. And so we'll be watching this in the weeks and months ahead. And my guess is we'll be revisiting this topic fairly regularly as these webinars move forward. But for now, at least, let's move forward onto our second issue. Because while the California recall election is now a week past, what we're just beginning to understand is how there might be lessons from the unsuccessful recall attempt against Gavin Newsom that might be applicable in next year's midterm elections in the battle for control of Congress. Um, I would imagine that the majority of our group that lives in California is pretty happy to have the recall over. And for those of you who've, who are from out of state, I know you've watched it with some curiosity. But there are national ramifications here, and I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about them before we get to the bottom of the hour and bring Jessica on uh, to join me for, uh, for your questions. So first things first, California obviously is much more heavily democratic than the country as a whole. When Arnold Schwarzenegger was elected governor in our last recall election back in 2003, the state was already fairly deep blue. 18 years later, I think you could make the case that California is mm, positively indigo. So there are limits on what can be applied in races in more competitive purple states, given how heavily Democratic California voters are. But that said, the strategy that Newsom's team used to beat back the attack on his governorship can still provide some valuable lessons to his fellow Democrats as they formulate their strategies for next year's campaigns. And most of the lessons to be learned by Democrats and Republicans alike in other parts of the country is directly related to the way that Newsom has been talking about the coronavirus. And we'll dig into that a little bit more in just a minute. Before we do, I wanna ask you a question to kick off this second topic. When it comes to COVID, what type of candidate would appeal to you most as a voter? Do you want a candidate who supports further shutdowns 
like we had last year and earlier this year, a candidate who supports further shutdowns until the COVID threat has at least some degree subsided. Do you support a candidate who supports mask and vaccine mandates until the Delta variant has subsided to some degree? So not a full shutdown like we'd seen previously, but mandates on vaccines and masks. Third, would you like to see a candidate, would you like to see political leaders who encourage their constituents to wear masks and get vaccinated, but not to mandate it, not to require it? Or fourth, would you prefer a candidate, a political leader, who says each one of us should make these decisions for ourselves? And while the leader, him or herself, may or may not get vaccinated, it's up to each one of us to decide whether it's the right thing on, uh, uh, from, our, from our perspective. Well, what did our group have to say on this one, Claire? Huh, that is an overwhelming number, and it's not a particularly surprising one, given what we've learned about this group over the course of our year and a half together. 87% say that they would support a candidate who mandates masks and vaccines until the COVID threat has diminished. Only 5% want someone more stringent to go back to the shutdowns that we saw in 2020 and early 2021. 7% say they want to see a political leader who encourages but doesn't require masks and vaccines. And not a single one of us has said that this is something that should be left to, to individuals for themselves. Not surprisingly, but still instructive. So now Newsom, if you remember, we talked about this a little bit previously. Newsom began the recall campaign very much on the defensive. And when the recall was qualifying, he was spending a lot of time trying to explain what many Californians, what most Californians, according to the polls, viewed as a very inconsistent oversight of the pandemic, trying to explain and defend his shutdown orders, and of course, trying to defend and explain his decision to join lobbyist friends for an expensive dinner at a Napa Valley restaurant at the same time he was telling the rest of California to avoid those kind of gatherings. But it was only, and it was, and, and as we've talked about before, it was only after that dinner that energy for the recall really began to build. But over the months, through the spring and summer of 2021, Newsom was able to transform what could have been a near fatal political weakness into a considerable political strength. And let me quantify that for you. Last spring, last March, the leading polls in California showed that only about one third of California voters approved of the job that Newsom had done in overseeing the fight against the pandemic. One third, that was in March. By September, Within a week or so of the election, that number had basically doubled. Roughly two thirds of Californians, by the time the campaign ended, thought that Newsom had been doing a good job. Now, some of this was for reasons beyond the control of Newsom or any other politician. Most importantly, I'd argue, was, was the availability of vaccines over the spring and summer, because that meant that the most onerous measures that Newsom was imposing on most Californians was no longer an economic shutdown or stay-at-home orders. Really, rather, what he was asking for instead was simply that most Californians wear masks in public places. And the shutdowns from last year and early this year, well, they caused immense economic and social and political upheaval. But by comparison, even though most voters here don't love the mask requirements by any means, for most Californians, wearing a mask wasn't nearly as big of a deal by comparison. And so by contrasting his approach here in California with what voters were reading about in Florida and Texas and other red states with more conservative governors, Newsom was able to make the comparative case that his approach was a much more uh, a much more successful one. Now, he had something else helping him make that argument, though, uh, again, beyond the control of him or any other politician. Believe it or not, 
Newsom was helped dramatically by the onset of the Delta variant. Because if you remember last spring, back when, I, as I've said before, back when we thought that vaccines made us invulnerable, last spring when California and most of the country was starting to reopen again, there were fierce debates around the country about whether states with stricter requirements like California had more successfully weathered the virus than states like Florida and Texas that had, avoided, that had avoided more stringent shutdown measures. And the national debate on that was actually fairly balanced between those who thought that one approach made more sense and those who thought that the other did. But as the new strain of COVID had a devastating effect over the summer and early fall on non-vaccinated communities around the country, the disparity between cases between hospitalizations and deaths became much more pronounced. And so by late summer, public opinion polls showed that vaccinated Americans were getting more and more frustrated with those who'd resisted the shots. And that frustration against the unvaccinated had manifested itself into much greater public support for masks and vaccine mandates. Now Newsom seized on these changing attitudes and he used them to transform the recall campaign from an up or down referendum on his own record into a choice between himself and opponents who he characterized as anti-mask and anti-vaccine. You remember a week or two, I shared with you a quote that Joe Biden used to like to use. He'd say, don't compare me with the almighty, compare me with the alternative. And that once again, essentially was Newsom's approach an up or down referendum on his stewardship was a, a question he was struggling to convince voters on. But once he turned it into a comparison and a contrast, that's when he began to succeed. Now, of course, his most visible foe was conservative talk show host, host Larry Elder. But I would agree that as, I would argue that as much as Newsom ran against Elder, he ran just as aggressively against Ron DeSantis and against Greg Abbott, the governors of Florida and Texas, and the leaders of other red states as well. So Newsom beat the recall by a landslide, roughly the same 30-point margin by which Biden had defeated Trump here last November. But the way he embraced COVID-related mandates was very instructive. And while Democratic heavy California has always been more receptive to this type of more restrictive approach than the rest of the country. Newsom's strategy could still be very effective and very relevant in swing states next year for Democrats. And the reason for that is that even in a purple state, even in a swing state where the voters are balanced much more equally between Democrats and Republicans, the key in a midterm election is to motivate a party's base. In a presidential campaign, the candidate's main goal is to persuade undecided voters to move in one direction or the other. But in midterm elections, when voting turnout is down, it becomes more about motivating your own base. And as we know from looking at political history, in the overwhelming majority of midterm elections in the modern era, the president's party has lost seats because the president, Democrat or Republican, tends to be less able to motivate his supporters than an opposition party that's still angry about the outcome of the previous election. So especially with Joe Biden's poll numbers dropping to the degree that they are, motivating Democratic loyalists next November is beginning to look like a real challenge for the party. And if Newsom has demonstrated to Democrats in other parts of the country, not how to persuade swing voters, because that's not what Newsom was trying to do. I don't think he bothered talking to swing voters for the last few months before the election. But if Newsom can demonstrate to swing state Democrats how to use COVID-related mandates as a way of motivating their base, then that could be a very, very effective strategic tool going forward. Question for you, if we can, Claire. How important an issue do you think COVID will be in next year's elections? Do you think it'll be the single most important issue? 
Second, do you think it will be an important issue, one of several important ones, but not just the most important? Second, it will be somewhat important, one of many issues. Or fourth, not important at all. And let's see what we get on the response here. Ninety-two percent of you, look at that, very interesting. Ninety-two percent of you say it will either be the single most important issue or one of several important issues. And I think that's worth, it's, it's that cautionary note that 82% of you followed is probably smart because of course we have no idea what the world's gonna look like in 13 and a half months. Will there be another variant of the virus that's emerged to shut us down again? Will it be something that's completely in the rearview mirror or something in between we don't know? But it is worth assuming without knowing what the world will look like next November that it will be one of many important issues. So there's certainly other issues that can motivate the Republican base. But if this is a tool that Newsom can provide to Democratic candidates in other parts of the country, it doesn't necessarily guarantee success, but it certainly does provide an additional political weapon for swing state Democrats to use during the debate over the campaign for Congress. Just out of curiosity, and then we'll uh, bring Jessica on and come to your questions. Just out of curiosity, because we ask you this question every once in a while, what do you consider is going to be the most important issue for 2022? A certain percentage of you, a small percentage of you said that you think it's going to be COVID. But what do you think it's going to be if not? Will the economy be the most important issue next year? Whether the economy is measured by jobs, by taxes or inflation? Will it be climate change? Will it be health care? not just pres prescription drugs and Medicare and the expansion of Obamacare, but abortion rights also fitting into that category? Or will it be immigration? Of those five issues, and I know there's plenty more, what are the ones that you think, what's the one that you think will be the most important next year? 71%, very interesting figure, almost three quarters of you believe that the economy is gonna drive next year's election. But of course, as we know, as we've established in the past, the single greatest indicator as to the nations and the world's economic recovery is going to be how effectively we handle COVID. So even though only 7% of you listed COVID as a standalone issue as the most important topic in next year's midterms, let's agree about the profound effect it's going to have on economic issues and other policy matters that voters are going to be continuing next, uh, considering next year. So look, there's plenty else to talk about. Uh, most notably, and we've already made this one of our topics for next week, given the events at the U.S.-Mexico border and given the discussions going on in Congress, it appears that immigration is re-emerging as a top tier issue and that will be one of our topics for discussion next week. Of course, we can talk about it again over the next 25 or 30 minutes, if you like, but just wanted to let you know that next week we will be looking at immigration as one of our topics. In the meantime, though, if Jessica's around, maybe she can rejoin us and we will broaden the conversation to hear what the rest of our group thinks about what's going on. How are you, Jessica? Doing well, thank you so much. And thank you to our audience, uh, just as a uh, to add on to what Kim said earlier, we do depend on your support to make uh, these programs available. So if you are able to become a member, uh, make a donation, we would greatly appreciate it. You can visit our website, lawacth.org. Uh-oh. Jessica seems to have frozen uh, a little bit. Um, in the meantime, um, Claire, I don't know if you're in a position to access the questions that Jessica has been getting, but if she's going to be frozen for a bit of time, then perhaps uh, perhaps you'll be able to step in and help us with some of those questions either. Okay. Hello, Dan. Here I oh, am from uh, behind the scenes. Um, here, to, here to save the day. I'm here to save the day. Uh, so I will start. Just give me one second to pull up some of our audience questions. Um, and we'll start with, um, I read somewhere that Australia should have been the one to inform France. Is that true? If so, why? Okay, so it's a, it's a really smart question. And that's the point that US government officials have been trying to make without offending Australia right at the beginning of this new agreement. Um, 
And because Australia did have the prior deal with France, technically it was on them to let the French know that the submarines that the French were going to be producing for Australia were not nearly as adequate for that nation's defenses as the ones that the US promises to build. And Australia's leaders have said that they've indicated to France over the last several months that the submarines that the French had uh, contracted to build were not adequate. But it doesn't seem like they told the French in no uncertain terms, we're going to back out of this agreement and make one with the US instead. Though if you want to, you can put that in the laps of the Aussies. That said, the United States is the leader of the free world and its relationship with France and other Western European countries is of critical importance. And so even if it is accurate that Australia bears much of the responsibility for the lack of communication, I think understanding and recognizing that Australia and France had not had that conversation, it does seem to me that the Biden administration should have either been more forceful in telling Australia, you have to do this, or preferably going to France and saying, I know you're not going to like this, but friends and allies are honest with each other. And while I don't think the French would have been thrilled with the loss of a multi, multi-billion dollar defense deal, where the real venom and the real uh, critic harsh criticism seems to be coming from is not on the substance of the agreement, but on the way uh, the change was communicated. So yeah, pin this on Australia if you want, but ultimately, if you're going to be the leader of the free world, you got to take some of these things on yourself if somebody else, if nobody else is going to. Great. And then continuing on the topic of China, how big a threat is the potential financial meltdown of Chinese real estate developments to U.S. and world economic stability? This has negatively impacted Wall Street over the past few days. Oh, very smart question. And it's been clear for some time now that Chinese real estate investors have been dramatically over leveraged, taking on much, much more debt than is appropriate uh, given the current economic circumstances, both in China and around the world. I think even the Chinese government realizes that their private sector real estate interests have overstepped and have been trying to move them back, but they haven't been doing it nearly quickly enough. And if you look at the default that is coming from China's largest real estate investor, it is larger than some of the national defaults we've read about in recent years, bigger than the default in Greece, for example, by multiple factors. And so because of China's impact on the international economy, and because many of these interests are in other places around the world as well, it does look like if this current trend continues, it could not only impact the U.S. stock market, as it has over the last several days, but have a much broader uh, downward economic impact as well. Once again, you do see the Chinese government scrambling somewhat belatedly and probably not aggressively enough to course correct for the real estate investors. Uh, but they are making the effort and we'll see if it's enough probably in the next several days. So if the U.S. is trying to stop China from stealing intellectual property and trade secrets from both the U.S. and U.S. allies, what plans need to be implemented to achieve this? Well, and this is the question that the Biden, Trump, Obama, and Bush administrations have all been struggling with, even as the challenges have gotten more and more significant. Uh, the Biden administration believes that one way of pushing back at China is to impose greater tariffs. And that, as I said earlier, is a fundamentally different theory than we saw in the Bush and Obama administrations. Uh, make no mistake about it that while Biden uses different language, he trends toward isolationism on trade issues the same way Trump does. does. And if your natural inclination is to retreat economically from the rest of the world, looking at tariffs as a way of discouraging this bad behavior is a very, very tempting weapon to employ. You know, what, el what else can be done? Uh, the U.S. can leverage international uh, relationships, not to impose tariffs, but to make it more difficult uh, for Chinese 
to sell products, particularly sensitive product, product uh, technological products, not just in the US and other parts of the world. And this is why the international cooperation is so important. The US is obviously a very large market, but it's not large enough to have a uh, relevant level of damage on Chinese economic interests. It does require the US working in concert with its allies on the Pacific Rim in Europe and elsewhere in order to have enough of an impact to encourage China to step back on some of this behavior. And because I was saying earlier, the administration's posture on trade issues has been somewhat uneven. It becomes harder to convince our allies, even economic allies, that a more confrontational uh, approach is worth, is worth taking on. The other challenge here gets back to the question of compartmentalization that we talked about earlier. If you can look at these issues holistically, human rights, security, economic issues, piracy issues, climate change issues, if you look at them, uh, if, uh, if, if you look at each one of them individually, there's not much leeway. Once they're grouped together, you have a lot more points of leverage at your disposal. And so I think given the current circumstance, the US is relying heavily on economic countermeasures to discourage Chinese piracy. But ultimately, it's at least my belief um, that discouraging purchases until the piracy abates, instead of imposing tariffs that hurt the economies in, in both countries, is a preferable is a preferable path to take. Well, you just kind of answered the next question, which was going to be how effective uh, would additional tariffs be in restraining undesirable behaviors on the part of the Chinese? So extra points to you, Dan. Um, <laughs> all right, moving on uh, back to the Biden administration. Was the Biden administration less than competent again in offending French in, in offending the French in the Australia deal? Well, what I've learned over uh, the last several months is that whenever I compliment anything that Joe Biden has done, our after webinar surveys talk about how hopelessly I am in the bag for the Biden administration. And whenever I criticize anything that Joe Biden does, we get all sorts of comments in our survey responses telling me how unfairly biased I am against. I really would argue that this administration does some things very well and some things poorly. But on this front to this particular question, it does seem that for all of Biden's language, for all of his verbal emphasis about the need to re-strengthen our relationships with our traditional Western allies, that looking not just at Afghanistan, not just at this submarine deal, but also with the way we've handled issues relating to COVID and international travel, it doesn't seem like the administration is working in the same kind of cooperative way as Biden has indicated would be his intent at the outset. On each of these individual decisions, administration spokespersons will explain why the decision made sense substantively. But the cumulative effect, as we saw, uh, from France last week, and as we've seen from other European leaders over the last few months, is that you hear an increasing number of voices from Europe saying, hey, Biden talks a good game, but in subs but substantively speaking, we're not getting much more in the way of cooperation from this administration than we were from his predecessor. Great, and as we now move on to a conversation on Governor Newsom, I think Jessica is back with us. Hey, sorry. You guys are a terrific team. Thank you for pinch hitting, Claire. All right, uh, thank anytime. you, Claire. All right, sorry, audience. I, my Wi-Fi went down and I disappeared, so I apologize for that disruption. And Dan, I apologize to you as well. I'm sure that was. No worries at all. Glad you're back. Yeah, thank you. All right, um, this question, given that Larry Elder received less than 27% of the total votes cast in the recall election, how viable a candidate do you think he would be if he runs against Gavin Newsom in 2022? I think the question is based on the definition of viability. Would Elder, if he runs again, have much of a chance of beating Newsom? Uh, 
I'd say unless the political landscape in California changes dramatically over the next year, probably not. Uh, the state is overwhelmingly Democratic to begin with, and Elder represents the most conservative faction in the Republican Party, making him less well positioned to reach out to independent and other centrist voters. So in a general election, I think his chances in a rematch against Newsom would be pretty would be, would be pretty slim. And he, Elder himself, has acknowledged that, saying that he felt he would have to raise a lot more money or do something else differently in order to run a successful campaign next year. But viable means different things to different people. Larry Elder has emerged over the last couple of months as the de facto leader of the Republican Party in California. And even though he wasn't elected governor last week, and even though it's unlikely he'll be elected governor next year, what he has done is established some real privacy over the state's conservative movement. And for a Republican Party that's been involved in a debate about how it should conduct itself in a post-Trump era, um, Elder's campaign for governor, while ultimately coming up short on question number one, was so successful on question number two that it answered that directional question for us. California Republicans, like the majority of Republicans in the rest of the country, according to public opinion polling, aren't ready to move on from the Trump era yet. And a lot of people had assumed that if Trump did not run for president again, that the party would move on from him. And what Elder's campaign, the relative success of it, the directional success of it, seems to indicate is that even if he, Trump himself, does not run for office again in 2024, that a sizable faction of Republicans here and nationally are going to look for candidates like him to support instead. So for those voters who are looking for a more traditional conservative candidate, who are looking for a more centrist candidate, those are fights that will be fought over the midterms and the 2024 Republican primaries. But the elders' results in their recall election say that there's a lot of people in the Republican Party who want to stick with Trumpism, even if Trump himself is not the standard bearer. Newsom did not hesitate in signing SB9 and SB10 immediately after defeating the recall. Uh, maybe you can describe what those were in your answer. Very many who supported him during the recall were hopeful that you would review and consider the consequences before making a final decision. Doesn't he know that we will remember and think long and hard about our vote in 2022? Oh, one of the seminal issues in California before COVID was the lack of affordable housing. Uh, it's an issue that continued to fester during the coronavirus, even if COVID gets a lot more public and political attention. And it's one that's going to be with us for many years, even once the virus has passed. So over the last few years, the legislature has produced any number of pieces of legislation designed to increase affordable housing. And they've done this in a variety of ways, most by moving decision-making power away from local government and imposing different types of mandates from the state level. The thought being that very few localities want more housing in their own communities. This is known as the NIMBY syndrome, N-I-M-B-Y, not in my backyard. And over the last few years, the legislature has not passed these bills. This year, they passed two of them. Uh, and one of them allows more units to be built on a piece of property that's currently only zoned for one unit. Now you could put as many as four units on those properties, regardless of whether local government thinks it's a good idea or not. And SB 10, the other housing bill, is a little bit more arcane, but the short version is it does make it easier to build additional housing, even if local government objects to it in the form of small apartment buildings, 10, of, 10 units or less near to transit or large scale commercial interests. Both of these are very controversial bills because while on one hand, the authors and supporters argue correctly how badly California needs additional affordable housing. On the other hand, the communities that are gonna be most affected by this housing generally tend to resist these kind of bills because they don't want these decisions being made by people in Sacramento, uh, 
or in other parts of the state. What the questioner is referencing is why Newsom waited until after the recall election to sign these two very controversial bills. And the questioner pretty much answered their own question. He knew that he knew some knew that they were controversial, knew that signing the bills would cost him some support, probably not enough for the recall to pass given what the final margin was like. But Newsom didn't want to do anything to cause controversy before the vote. Once it was over, he signed the bills. And when the questioner says, doesn't he think we won't remember this next year? In fact, Newsom is counting on the fact that you won't remember it next year. Or in fact, so few people do remember that he signed these bills, that it's not going to have a particular impact on his campaign. I'll apologize for those of you who did not appreciate that meandering walk through the Arcania of California housing policy. But the short version is there's not nearly enough housing here. Newsom is, has signed two bills to try to make it easier to add more affordable housing, but it is incredibly controversial legislation because the people who live in those communities don't always want more, more crowded circumstances. And he decided in a fairly politically adroit bill, if you're gonna do something controversial, you might as well do it the day after the election rather than the day, the day before. Thank you. We had two people ask, uh, do you think Newsom would have beaten the recall if it weren't for Larry Elder? It would have been, I think it would have been much closer. The leading Republican until Elder entered the race was Kevin Faulkner, who is not a moderate, but he is what we call a more traditional Bush Romney pre-Trump conservative. Uh, as it happens, Faulkner is pro-choice. He's supported a number of immigration reform bills. Um, he's taken some steps on climate change, though not as aggressively as, as Newsom has called for. But regardless of whether you happen to be a staunch progressive, a staunch, staunch conservative, or more of a centrist, Faulkner is decidedly closer to the political center in California than the other leading Republican candidates, uh, Kevin Kiley, John Cox, and of course, Elder. Does that mean that Faulkner could have won, would have won? We have no way of knowing. Because even though Faulkner is much more of a traditional conservative, although he did not vote for Trump in 2016, he did say publicly that he did support Trump in 2020 on economic issues as opposed to some of the other more controversial things in which Trump had involved himself. So my guess is, given that Faulkner, the otherwise fairly centrist candidate, did say he voted for Trump in 2020, that Newsom would have gone after Faulkner just as aggressively for being a California version of Trump as he went after Elder. Would it have been as effective against a more centrist candidate as opposed to a more conservative individual? I don't know. But I do think that Faulkner would have been better positioned to withstand some of that assault. The counter on that is he, Faulkner, might not have been as capable of motivating and mobilizing conservative Republicans to turn out. But what we have learned over the last few statewide elections in California is a conservative Republican candidate can motivate conservative Republican voters, but has difficulty reaching out to the political center. We haven't seen a candidate try the center outreach approach. We haven't seen a Republican candidate try that approach since Schwarzenegger back in the early mid 2000s. And Faulkner might have been better positioned to attempt it than, than Elder. Well, vaccine mandates drive vaccine hesitant workers to move to red states? Well, it's a very good question. And I don't know the answer to that. And I haven't seen polling on this, but I suspect that the number of people who will move from one state to another on this is relatively low. And the reason I've, I, I believe that, and I will stress that it is just guesswork, is that while it is something that anti-vaxxers find very annoying and very angering, many are not in jobs that lend themselves to easy relocation. In other words, the people who we saw moving during COVID tended to be those who could work from home, who could, you know, who could work online, and who could work from anywhere. 
and the socioeconomic breakdown of those who are most resistant to, vaccine, uh, to COVID vaccinations tend to be more working class voters whose work does require them to be physically present in the workplace. That's not to say that a certain number of those individuals won't leave California. It's just a much more difficult transition for them than those whose work does allow them to work from, from other locations. So it's, it's possible. I don't think we'll see it in great numbers. To the extent that it happens, it may be as part of the broader shift we've seen over many years, taking place not just because of vaccinations, but because of housing prices and because of other many other economic factors that have driven working class voters out of the state. So in other words, if you were gonna, we're already thinking about leaving, this might tip the scale, but I don't think it's going to convince someone who was committed to California to leave all on its own. Landlords are being legislated to absorb the loss of non-paying tenants and the California COVID rent relief is not distributing money. What do you see happening on these issues? Well, this is a wrenching issue that is getting not nearly as much attention as it deserves. Oh, for the better part, for more than a year, uh, in California and in many other places around the country, we've seen an eviction moratorium where renters who are not able to pay their rent because of COVID-related economic losses are protected from eviction. So those eviction protections are for the most part lapsing at this point. And so the next question becomes is what sort of protections can you offer for these, uh, for these individuals. California has decided to offer additional protections, but as the questioner correctly points out, that puts landlords on the economic hook. And if you're a multinational corporation that owns skyscrapers, that's one thing. But if you are a retired couple, if you are a middle or lower to middle income individual or a couple that rents out a couple of rooms, not getting the majority of rent for those apartments for an extended period of time can be very, very onerous. What complicates this even further is only one tiny fraction of the tens of billions of dollars that the federal government has designated for renter support has actually made it to the renters and the landlords. Some of that's bureaucracy, some of that's the complication of the process, uh, some of it is language and cultural barriers. But more than 90% of the money that's been allocated to help these renters hasn't yet made it to the destination. And so you're hearing a lot of not just Republicans, but moderate Democrats in Congress saying, why should we spend more money on this until the money that we've already designated is spent? Um, I don't think we're going to see mass evictions either in California or elsewhere. I think primarily because the economic pain felt by a landlord is less visible than that felt by a tenant, that unhappily, landlords are gonna still continue to take a real economic hit until the state and federal government can figure out a way to get those relief funds out the door more quickly than they have to date. Yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult situation that I think we're all facing here. So Dan, thank you so much um, for another great talk. And to our audience, thank you for your great questions. A lot came in about immigration. So I hope that you guys will join us next Tuesday when Dan is gonna delve into that more. Yes. We will definitely dig very deeply on the immigration issue between what we've seen at the US-Mexico uh, US border over the last few days, given the decision by the parliamentarian and the Senate not to allow for immigration reform to be part of the reconciliation bill. There's a lot going on on this front. And so I hope you will come back so we can talk about the issue in the depth and breadth that it deserves. Well, Dan, thank you so much. And uh, I will turn this back over to Kim. And again, apologize. I apologize for my uh, technical issues. Sorry about that. No apology necessary. We're glad you're back. Thank you, Jessica. And a big kudos to Claire, whose birthday is on Friday. So happy birthday, Claire. And thanks for rescuing us. <laughs> Dan, that was superb. And for those of you who love Dan, like we all do, uh, every other week, and this occurs this evening, Right after his regular program, we have a special um, members only conversation with Dan on a format where you can talk with Dan directly. So if you're interested 
in engaging with Dan directly, please consider becoming a member and join us for his special after program. Dan, if you just give me a second, I have a terrific lineup of programs that are coming up that I'm sure our viewers would love to see and hear about. On our website, you can go lawacth.org and get all the detailed information on what I'm just going to give you a quick thumbnail sketch on. So on September 23rd, the future of money with economist Eshwar Prashad and KABC radio host Frank Motek. And of course, Dan on September 28th, politics in the time of coronavirus at 5 p.m. On the 29th, the diplomat's bold vision for the future of the United Arab Arab Emirates. On October 1st, U.S.-Australian cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. October 4th, on tyranny is our democratic republic on the brink of authoritarianism. We have a conversation with the CEO and president of Edison International, Pedro Prisano, who will be giving a terrific program on California's pivotal climate change. That's on October 7th. On the 13th, Risk, a user's guide with General Stanley McChrystal. And on the 15th, a conversation with Dr. Fiona Hill. For those of you who have enjoyed her before on this program, she's the Senior Director of European and Russian Affairs at the United Nations National Security Council. So just, just a thumbnail, you've got to find out more and register today. Please go to our website. Also make a donation, become a member. We really appreciate everything you do. Stay safe. Dan, can't wait to see you next Tuesday. We've, we've already got a whole lineup of topics for you. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to it and I look forward to seeing the whole group back here again next week.